So I've taken some of Mike Del Preti's uh, research. He's a professor from the University of Colorado, and he is the foremost researcher of iBuyers, and I've broken that down and I'm presenting that as part of this as well. But anyway, some cool stuff. So let's talk about some numbers. Now, we've not gotten together since, oh gosh, October? Well, as far as getting numbers for the company. So let's kind of back up just a second and look at November 2019, December 2019, and then January 2020, okay? So here we are in November, the November snapshot. In November 2018, you guys booked 182 million. Uh, we paid you 4.8 million in transaction count of 578. November 2019 had a nice little pop. 210 million, 5.3 million, 672. That's 15.3% increase, 9.6 and 16.25, uh, 16.28 actually, it rounded up to 16.3. Inventory was down. 7.8% from the end of October. <clears throat> but if you look compared to November of 2018, it was fairly level, fairly constant there. Inventory is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, as we know, particularly in specific price ranges. So we want to pay attention to those numbers. I characterize those as leading indicators in what's happening in the marketplace. Inventory tightens, could be a question mark in what's coming ahead. Inventory loosens, could be a question mark in what's coming ahead. So those are your leading indicators. Look at December, December of 2018, you guys booked 192 million. And just so you know, if you've not seen how I do these before, that is across all property types company-wide, okay? We paid 5 million in commissions on 603 transactions. And December 2019, you had a really nice pop at the end of the year. You're up 24% on your gross sales, 23% uh, on commission, 15% on transactions. But inventory fell off the cliff. Uh, it was down 19% from the end of November, 19.9, almost 20%. That's a huge decrease. However, look at the comparison of December 31 this year to December 31, 2018. You can see that they were fairly level. So you can assume from that that the drop off in December is characteristic of seasonality. Am I getting too technical for y'all? All right. I use these big economic words and I get deep in it. What was it Mike Nichols called me the last time? A data geek or data nerd? What was it you called me, Mike? Data geek. Okay. Well, I'm a data geek. And, and trust me, originally this was almost 25 slides longer and I cut it back. January 2019, you guys booked 127 million on 3.4 million in commissions, 425 transactions. In January 2020, you were up 15% over last year uh, on gross sales, 12.9% on gross commissions, and 16.7 on transaction count. Nice little increase there. If you recall the, the most recent stats from uh, GNR uh, press release, I think they were saying the market was up 5.6%. So you guys are 10% ahead of the market. Kudos to you. And inventory is recovering. So that's a good thing, right? Uh, 1,100, if you look at January 31 this year versus January 31 last year, um, 67 units difference. So not bad at all. Seasonality is what it is. All right, look at some averages here. These are the averages. Uh, we'll do totals in a minute, but the averages, can y'all see okay? Is this in your way? Okay. Um, our average uh, gross sales, average monthly gross sales, and I just kind of popped them up here on the screen all at once except for 2019. I'm sorry, yeah, 2019. Uh, the average monthly gross sales in 15 was 129, 129 million average per month, okay? Uh, 2016, 157, 2018, 2017, 180, 2018 jumped up over 200 million per month in average gross sales. So that's good for you, but you did even better in 2019 because you are 12% increase. Average monthly gross sales, $227 million. Uh, commissions, we do that one too as a key, key uh, performance indicator. In 2015, it was an uh, average of 3.3. By the time you got to 2018, it was 5.4 on average gross commissions paid per month. And then on 2019, that jumped up to 5.8 million. So that's a big deal because your admin folks process every penny of that and they handle every penny of that. So when you see your admin person, give them a big hug because they are working their butts off for uh, processing those numbers through here like that. It's a, it's a good increase, 8% increase. Transaction count kind of followed the same pattern, right? 
2015, it was 464. It rose to 651 average transactions per month. Again, company-wide across all property types. Uh, in 2018 and then 2019 jumped up over 700 units per month. That's outstanding. Um, that should be the point where you retch your elbow patting yourself on the back because there's not another company in Middle Tennessee doing these sorts of numbers on average. Okay. Good for you. Good for you. On the grand totals. Um, by the way, on posting, taking pictures. You're welcome to do that if you want to, but we are actually going to put together a video. I just didn't want to tell all the people that didn't sign up that we're doing a video because then they wouldn't sign up and you wouldn't be here. Half of you wouldn't be here. Uh, it's a nice venue. It's a nice event. We wanted to do a nice thing here, so we are going to do a after-the-fact video. So you will have those stats and you will have these slide, these, uh, slide deck in it as well, so you can refer back to it. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, Sister Caitlin is actually going to be getting, uh, leaving to go get married on Friday. So, hey, way to go, Caitlin! Uh, she's really embarrassed now. <laughs> uh, so it may be a few days before she gets her head screwed back on, but uh, she'll, be, uh, she'll be putting this video together, and that's what we're, all the microphones and stuff are doing now. So grand totals, uh, here are the grand totals, the annual gross sales. Uh, we did not jump over $1 billion a year until 2014. So 2014 was the first year we jumped over. So 1.5 billion, that's with a B. I'm not slurring my words, it's with a B. Uh, 1.8 billion, 2.1. So in 2017, we went over 2 billion. So actually three years, about every three years, we're jumping about a billion dollars in sales. In 2019, you're at $2.7 billion in sales across all property types. Congratulations to you. <clears throat> That's a really big number. So you ought to be really, really happy with that. Really, really proud. I know that I am proud of you. Uh, commissions paid, 40 million in 2015. We jumped up all the way to 64 million in 2018. And I don't know how we did it, but somehow we processed $70 million in commissions in 2019. And I'll show you some other stats here in a minute that shows how much you kept versus how much we kept. And you'll go, oh, wow, we kept a lot of money. You should be really happy about that. Uh, transaction count, 5,500 units in 2015, and it jumped up to 20, all the way to 2,808 in 2018, and by 2019, it was 8,600 transactions. How many does that work out to per week? That's about 350 a week. When you think of it that way, it's pretty astounding, isn't it? So we may not be Remax, but we sell a boatload of houses. I'm just telling you. So... This is the same data you just saw. It's presented uh, horizontally instead of vertically. Uh, so you can see each year how it compares. 2015 goes across the gross sales, the commissions, the transaction count, and then 2019, 2.7 billion, 70 million in commissions on 8,607 transactions. That's a really good performance, y'all. If you want to express that in percentage terms, here you go, okay? From 2015 to 2019, your gross sales are up 176%. And by the way, on percentages, I know some of you are not data geeks, Mike. <clears throat> so if you want to uh, express 100% means it doubles. Okay, so that's times two. Times two plus 76%. All right. So 176% on gross sales, 174% on gross commissions, 155% on transaction count and agent count, 166%. And then five year period, you went from 688 agents to 1140 agents. And if my math serves me correctly, we've already added about another 15 agents since I prepared this slide. So we're growing fast and it, and it bodes well for the future. A lot of people ask about our sales dollar growth, our commission growth, our transaction count growth. They say, well, is that not accounted for by agent growth? As you can see by the percentage comparisons, it is not, right? If that's were the fact, then the agent count would be 166. The gross sales will be 166, the trend commissions will be 166. We're actually growing faster than our aging count, which means you guys are more productive. And that's the benefit of hiring experienced agents. So kudos to you, kudos to you. Uh, company and market comparisons. This is where it gets interesting. Not because I'm taking a drink of water, but because it's interesting numbers. Yeah, 
It's not vodka. <coughs> but I made the Kool-Aid, so I'll drink it if I want. So there. <laughs> All right. So the numbers I'm going to give you come from the MLS. Do y'all remember this map? Used to be on the MLS, but now the areas have gone away. So it's not on the MLS anymore. But this is what Real Tracks covers. This is the geographic area that Real Tracks covers. And you can see that it has some in Kentucky and some in Alabama, which nobody in Alabama and nobody in Kentucky uses our MLS, but it's there if they want to. Uh, you get over here to the eastern part, you have Upper Cumberland, which Brother Scott now belongs to, so that's a separate MLS. Once you get to Cookville and beyond, you kind of have to belong to a different MLS. So really the area we're talking about is what I've bracketed here in the white box. When I say total real tracks data, that's the geographic area I'm talking about, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? Uh, when I talk about Greater Nashville MSA, and MSA stands for Metropolitan Statistical Area, we're talking about Davidson and the eight surrounding counties. I really don't know why Murray County is included in it or Dixon County because they don't touch Davidson, but they're included in the Greater Nashville MSA. So when I talk about Greater Nashville MSA data, that's the geographic area I'm talking about. Okay, so hold that in mind. Now, ranking the firms by transaction sides within the greater, uh, I'm sorry, within total real tracks, so this entire area, ranking the companies in that area, you guys are number two. One, one number I'll point out, and I hope you can see this in the back, it's kind of these, uh, I lied to you, I said the other type was the smallest, this is the smallest here. This productivity number on the right-hand side, the extreme right-hand college, number is percentage of producing agents. This is the number of agents total versus those who actually sold something. Who has the largest number in that column? Yeah, that's right, you do. And you ought to hold your head up and be proud of that because some of these guys are down around 60%. So here's another reason why we're number two. We have seven offices. The number one company has 18 offices presenting in that data. That's a huge difference, right? We'll talk about productivity of each of these offices here in just a second, but I wanted to point that out that, yeah, you're number two, and gee, that sinks. This is the entire real tracks now, right? All the real tracks, you're number two, but that's 18 offices reporting versus our seven. That's a big deal. Percentage market shares, let's look at that. All of real tracks, not just the Net Greater National MSA. You guys are at seven, according to my calculations, I'll show you some other calculations here in a sec. 7.33% market share in all of real tracks. That's a big number, guys. To get above one or 2% is a big deal. Uh, again, that's a, let's move over now to the Greater National MSA and what those numbers look like and how your comparisons stack up. And I think you're gonna like these a little bit better. It's a smaller geographic area, smaller pool, still a great number of competing offices, competing offices in there, but look at this. There's the total number, and there's you guys right there. You guys are number one in the Greater National MSA. And anybody says you're not, you tell them to call me, because I'm gonna hit them right in the mouth. And I'll point out that this is copyrighted data down here from Trend Graphics, a reporting service that we use. So unlike some others, we do not fudge our numbers. They are what they are. The facts are what the facts are. And there's the evidence for it. Now, according to my calculation on market share in the Greater Nashville MSA, you guys have a 9.37% market share. But I want to show you something different here in just a second. So 37% of everything that was sold in the Greater National MSA had a benchmark sign name associated with it, according to Trend Graphics. Again, copyright Trend Graphics. You can see the copyright note down in the right-hand corner. So I go to GNR and I look at their news release that they publish every month. Do y'all subscribe to their? If you're a member, you should get their newsletter, right? So they've got all the housing data and you can go to their website and you can pull this data up and look at it yourself because they also post it on their website. So I did a little comparison. Uh, GR total closings has reported in their news release versus benchmark total closings, which are reported from my numbers, our numbers. And then what that works out to on a market share percentage. And if I were you, I might want to use these numbers because it's really cool. 
In November, 3,232 3, closings, according to GNR, we had 672 of those. That equals the 20.8% market share. December, followed the same pattern, right? 3,482, December 693 was ours, and the December total then would be a 19.9% market share. And then for the year, they reported 42,356. Ours year was 8,607. And that equals a 20.3% market share for the year. Okay. It's legit. GNR said it was so. I might be putting that one in my listing presentation. Just saying. Um, market share by county. Now, I only did, I didn't do every county where we had a sale, obviously, because we'd be here until next week. But I did market share by county where we have actual have offices. Um, I didn't make a note, and I should have said something to you earlier on the slide, the Greater Nashville MSA. It was $2.5 in the Greater Nashville, even though our total sales were $2.7 billion. That means we had the rest of that was done outside of the Greater Nashville MSA. So uh, a lot of these, um, if you have an office in Davidson County, for example, a lot of their sales are going to be outside of Davidson County. But these are total sales that we sold in Davidson County. You guys have number one market share. At a 9.56% market share. <laughs> Williamson County, you're at 10.08% market share. In Wilson County, this is a real surprise. Kudos to the Mount Juliet bunch. You guys are now number one in, Mount, in uh, Wilson County. <laughs> I almost said to Scott, and then I looked down here and saw Stacy, and I said, well, I better not. I just said the Mount Juliet bunch. Sumner County's creeping on up there. Sumner County's got a new office now, so we have great expectations for this being, uh, so you can see that we're only marginally behind our next closest competitor there. And by the end of this year, I feel certain it will be number one in Sumner County as well. Rutherford County needs to come on and get up with it. With, I will say this, this fellow over here with a big column, he's been there for 40 years. So he's fairly well entrenched, right? But we're, we, we've snuck up on him. We're about to steal their cheese. So let's get it. <laughs> and I know that the burning question in your mind is what zip codes do we sell the most houses in? Everybody had that thought this morning as soon as they woke up, right? Well, there you go. Okay. Antioch, Spring Hill, Franklin, Mount Julia. Okay. And Southeast Davidson. So those are your number one zip codes of the productivity numbers for your top five zip codes for, for a benchmark. Is that cool? Y'all really loving this stuff, aren't you? It gets better. It's okay. It gets better. Um, office rankings and company productivity averages. This is where the brokers get real competitive with each other. Because this slide they live all year for, waiting for me to show them this slide. Uh, this slide shows what the, how the offices flow out. Uh, number one is Midtown. <laughs> number one Midtown. Cool Springs 115. Cool Springs 112. Mount Juliet, Murfreesboro, Hendersonville, West Nashville. So a total of 8,600, 2.7 billion. So y'all are coming along. Um, if we had not split uh, these two offices right here, 115 and 112, we would have had, gosh, what does that work out to? Three, 30, what's that, 4,100 units per all, for the office? It's awesome. Average sales price company wide uh, 215, uh, in 2015 was 278. It snuck on up, it broke 300 in 2018, and the climb continued in 2019 a 1.5% increase year over year. Just as a matter of note, and when you're using this, and if you're using this in your listing presentations in your data, then um, the average list price in, the average sales price in uh, Greater Nashville and GNR they were talking about was 305. So there's your comparison number, 305 versus 317. And you can dig that data up as well. Um, average closings per agent. This is a productivity company-wide productivity uh, number that we use. You see, we started out in 2015 at 8.58 closings per agent. In 2015, it, it peaked in 2016 at, at 9.4, and then began a decline, and the, the decline, unfortunately, continued. It's at 8.3. And you can say, well, that's just a 3% decrease, and I hate that, but look at this number right here. If you take all of real tracks, this is a number that's really gonna astound you, I promise you. All the real tracks were 114,000 transactions. There were 15,747 licensees in all of real tracks. That means the average closing in real tracks 
was 2.04. So if anybody asks, you can tell them you are four times better than everybody else. So how do the individual offices rank to all the other offices in real tracks, right? These are all the other company offices, individual offices. How do our offices rank compared to them? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We blow them all away. Uh, we're at number three, number five, number 12, number 13, number 22, number 32, number 63. Of 1,203 individual offices reporting, all of ours are in the top 65. That's a productive bunch right there. So good for you, good for you. Um, you remember the graph I showed you a while ago or the chart that I showed you a minute ago that had the number of offices reporting for the competitors versus us? Well, let's kind of break those down. The top five firms, company-wide reporting, we'll break them down by identifying the broker, the number of offices that were in the reporting data, the gross sales per office and the transaction count per office. This is where it gets really interesting, right? So let's look at the first one, which is our uh, Keller. They had 18 offices reporting. And in those 18 offices produced, each office produced $189 million, okay, for the year. Did you hear what I said? For the year, $189 million, that was their average production per office in 632 transactions. Tremendous difference, right? Uh, Reliant, they had eight offices. They were the next closest productive office. They were $119 million for the whole year per office. Uh, transaction count was 448. Parks, they reported 34 offices. They dropped under $100 million per office. This is total sales for the year. Total transaction count for the year for each of their offices on average. Obviously, more, some are more, some are less, but that's the average, okay? This one kind of blows me away. I do not know how they stay in business. Other than they charge like $70,000 to each agent. But <laughs> their average productivity per office was only $29 million and 103 units. Now, I'm just looking at raw data and I'm using a calculator and I'm not getting fancy, but those are factual data. And the other factual data I come up with is the one that says benchmark kicks their butt. Each of our offices on average had 389 million in production, 1,230 units, and congratulations. <laughs> I didn't know you could add sound to slides. Did you know that? that was pretty cool? I found that out the other day and I stuck that in here a couple of places. So let's put a bow on this and sum, sum up this part of the presentation. Our accomplishments for 2019. We still have zero debt. We never have had any debt, we never will have any debt. So everything we do is bootstrapped 100%. Uh, total agent count reached uh, 1140 at the end of 2018 as a comparison that, uh, that agent count was 992. Uh, that gives us a 14.9% increase year over year, which is a pretty good little increase, right? Uh, we completely, you guys don't know this, but we completely reorganized the company. I hired some consultants back in February a year ago and we basically peeled the layers of the onion back. We tore this company down and we rebuilt it from the ground up. So we realigned our compliance department, our agent care department, which is your training and your tools and your admin department. All of that has been redone. Why do we do that? You know, you hear reorganization in a company, you think, oh guys, something's in trouble. No, it's so we can grow. Because I knew the organizational structure we had was not stable enough to really face the growth that we're facing in the future here. Uh, we greatly expanded the Benchmark University offerings, and I mean greatly expanded. Uh, you, you guys that have been recently affiliated with us know that our agent orientation is now four hours long. We feed you, but it's four hours long. So we greatly expanded that. Uh, we've added a full-time marketing manager, Sister Caitlin's doing a great job for us, and we've expand, expanded our consumer branding efforts tremendously, which gives you the ability when you walk into in front of a client, a consumer, they already know the name Benchmark. We worked really hard this year on producing that stuff. We also negotiated an extensive contract and transitioned to a completely new managed network uh, company, and that was a booger bear right there. Uh, you go from one to the other when somebody's got all of your data and all of your information and all your technology in one spot and you try to move that to another company, try doing that a couple of times. It'll give you a heartache. See the gray here? See the gray here? It's falling out back here in the back too. So. 
uh, Benchmark Dash. We reorganized that and greatly streamlined that to make it a lot easier to use. If you're not on the Dash, you are missing out. You need to get on there like today. Um, dot loop, we integrated that and rolled that out. And the dot loop you guys have is not the dot loop everybody else has. It's a different dot loop. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Real Scout, Herculean effort. That's a big word. Herculean effort to get it fully integrated, to get it launched, to get all the training aligned, and then to set up from ground zero the business in a box project, which is huge. Paradigm Contact Gorilla. And uh, I see Richard come in. Richard, say, say everybody, hey, Richard. That's Richard kind of it. He came from England just to see you guys today. So give him a hug. <laughs> One thing that I'm particularly proud of is that your performance was recognized by T360, and we'll talk about T360 in a second. Uh, and we were placed on the Swanapool Power 200 watch list. They publish a uh, report every year of the 200 most influential people in real estate nationwide. So there's 200 people on the list, which rotates out, you know, frequently people move, leave the industry, they die, they retire, whatever. But there's only six people on the watch list. And so because of your efforts, we were put on that watch list this year. That's a big deal. Uh, we also did the new leases, the new build outs, the physical relocation of the Hendersonville office. Thank you, Jeremy and crew for all your efforts there. I don't know where Susan is. I know she's here somewhere. But there she is. Susan uh, did a great job with the move, and now we're in the throes of the, uh, the expansion in Cool Springs. We're adding another 2,300 square feet there, which will give us a real training room with real training room equipment and real training room audio. So we can do some more of this stuff. And then our charitable giving increase down total contributions are now exceeding six figures every year. And I get asked about this, you know, why does Benchmark not have a foundation? Why does Benchmark not do a Habitat for Humanity? Why does Benchmark not put our name on this charitable project or that charitable project? And my belief goes back to Matthew 6. And Matthew 6 says that you should help the needy. You should also do so in secret, so secret that your left hand does not know what your right hand is doing. And that's the way we do it. And as long as I'm running this company, that's the way we're going to continue to do it. So don't ask me. Uh, so how do we do about our goals in 2019? You know, we established a set of goals at the last presentation like this. And so you always want to go back to say, those were my written goals. Now, how do we do compared to our written goals? Well, you can probably think ahead at the numbers I've shown you already and can tell that we maintain zero debt. Our gross sales, we had stated our target would be 2.7 billion. And what was our gross sales? 2.7 billion. Our gross commissions, we had stated we wanted to hit a target of 70 million, and what were our targets? 70 million. Transaction count, we wanted to hit 8,500, we hit 8,600. The only portion where we fell a little bit short was on the agent count, but that's okay because the other ones hit there, and this is a big testimony to get having written goals. Every one of you should have written goals. If you don't write them down, you will never hit them. And that's what it is right there. So well done. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer. On the things that Benchmark has, do we know how many sold by Benchmark agents? I do have that data. You bet. And I'll be glad to share that with you privately. <laughs> goals for 2020. And I didn't do this one year and I got fussed at, so I'm going to put the goals out here for 2020. Yeah, Lisa Gray, you're the one that fussed at me. Uh, we're going to continue to maintain zero debt, of course, okay? We are going to exceed $3 billion. $3.2 billion is the target. I think you guys can do it. That's a $500 million jump, and I know you guys can do it. Increase the uh, gross commissions paid to $76 million. Transaction count to $9,500. Increase the agent count to $1,300. I'm being a little conservative on agent count, right? And then uh, source at least one more office within Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, and then finally continue to increase our charitable giving, as I said before. Those are the tactical goals for 2020 for our organization. Uh, the BHAGs, you know what a BHAG is? Right there on the screen if you don't. Big, hairy, audacious goals. It's a, it's a term coined by Jim Collins. Um, achieve and maintain number one market share in Middle Tennessee with a 40% separation. 
between us and the next closest competitor. Not a single month goes by, I don't get a call from somebody in another location, hey, can you bring that model down here? Can you bring that model down here? I did not do it, number one, because we don't do debt. And number two, because I didn't feel at the time that we had the organizational structure to manage it. The worst thing a company can do is outgrow its organizational structure, which is why we took a step back this year and completely reorganized the company. So that's the year in the, in the past. Now we'll take a look forward. These are the top 10 trends affecting our industry in 2020. This might be the part where you get your napkin out and cry. I'm kidding. <clears throat> These come from the trends report. And you can buy the trends report every year like I do. They're $200 a piece. Feel free. Uh, for us data geeks, that's about three months worth of reading because we read it and then we read it and we read back through it and we read back through it. It is not a novel. It is not a novel. It is not easy reading. But it's published by T360. So I'm going to let the author, Stefan Swanepoel, uh, share with you exactly what the report is in this little quickie video. Wow, this is what 14 years of trends report looks like. I read the news every day, you should as well. Inman delivers what happens yesterday. You should read other blogs and newsletters like uh, Notorious Rob. They give you an opinion piece on them, many other great opinions like that. But this, this is the only real research we have in the industry about what's happening. And the difference between research and the news or research and opinion pieces is that we sometimes take north of 40, 50, 60 hours to research just one chapter. And there's 10 in every, I think, you know, I think this is roughly two and a half thousand pages of a deep analysis. Our industry has always been changing, nothing's new, but, but the difference is that today it's happening faster, quicker, more comprehensively, it's more complicated. And where we used to take who four, five, six hundred hours to, to write one of these reports by, way back, you know, 2006, we are now spending sometimes close to a thousand hours on one report. And it's not just me. Yes, we, we read the news to find the stories. Then we do a, 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 a get an expert in, some of our people on our team, our consultants, we look at it, we, we get analysts in, we take a deeper dive, we, we spend hours, we, we, go to the, we go to the offices, we go to the customers, we test the products, we visit them, we interview them, we come back, we write it all up, and then sometimes I just rip it up and we start over. This, this, every chapter in the report sometimes goes through, I would say on average about 12 or 15 rewrites over a period of three or four months. That's what makes the Swanepoel Trends Report, which now next year is going to be in its 15th year, the closest thing we have in the residential real estate industry to a medical journal or the Harvard Business Law Review. This is the equivalent of that. If you truly care about the industry, if you want to be successful tomorrow, if you want to know what's going on and understand it, then let us give you the deep dive on the industry. We are currently working on the 15th edition. This is just a mock-up, but the 15th edition, which we've now been working on for about three months, maybe, I don't know, we don't keep track, seven, 800 hours, and I probably have still another 300 hours to go. I'm going to The sole purpose is to bring you the most objective, fair, balanced review and analysis of the most important 10 trends in our industry at the moment that is going to shape the decade that has changed everything and the decade that's going to come and probably create more transformation in the residential real estate industry than ever before. All right, so that's the actual author, Stefan Swanepoel, that heads up T3. T360 organization. Uh, obviously, I wanted to share that so you could understand the data and depth of knowledge that goes into this product and developing these 10 trends. Uh, so we're going to start out. The way they're structured is they are uh, 10 is the least important, one is the most important. We're going to have just a couple of slides on each one and then a takeaway, just a bullet point takeaway on each one. So the first trend we'll start with is number 10, inside the class action lawsuits, antitrust lawsuits that are going on right now. A lot of you don't even know this is happening, but it is important for you to understand. There are two lawsuits, Mueller and Sawbill, that basically filed against uh, NAR, Remax, Home Services America, Keller Williams, Realogy, uh, alleging a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, monopoly. 
they're saying that we're price fixing and setting the, uh, because of our practices in, in this industry, we are setting prices that are arbitrary and holding artificially holding prices high and therefore punishing the consumer. These are class action lawsuits with millions and millions and millions of dollars at stake. Okay. Uh, there was another set of lawsuits that was filed in April um, to two other different buyers. They added, began to add MLSs to uh, as, as plaintiffs, uh, excuse me, as defendants in the case. And then the Department of Justice entered in and they issued a uh, civil defense and a civil investigated demand letter which says we want to know all about your data at CoreLogic. CoreLogic is the largest, um, nation's largest MLS system vendor. So. You had three lawsuits going on. They're class action, four lawsuits. They're actually class action lawsuits. Two of those have been combined now, and now the Department of Justice has entered into it. And by May of 2019, over 20 different MLSs had been uh, added to defendants in the various lawsuits named as co-conspirators. All allege in one form or fashion that NARS buyer commission rule, that NARS insistent on sharing of the commission, blanket unilateral, unilateral offers of com compensation are antitrust violations and monopoly violations. Uh, they also talk about the mandatory interbroker compensation is anti-competitive based on NARS change in 96 uh, from all agents being sub-agents of the listing agent to agents being independent buyer brokers and requiring listing agents to offer compensation. A blanket com compensation offers in any competitive. This locks the sellers into con compensating all buyer brokers the same amount regardless of that agent's qualifications. Free enterprise would be you get what you earn in an anti-competitive situation, it would be everybody gets the same amount. Uh, steering by buyer's agents. Uh, plaintiffs allege that agents steer buyers away from properties that are offered below market. I know you guys would never do that, but it does apparently occur. An interesting side note, during the discovery process, some of the training literature from one of the major defendants actually stated if you offer below market compensation, your property will not be shown. They said that in their training literature, so that reinforced this part of the claim. It's unclear how buyers can negotiate the buyer broker commissions, right? Uh, so you're working essentially, even though you are getting paid by the seller and the listing agent, you are working for the buyer. And so there is an automatic conflict of interest there, they claim. Uh, NAR Code of Ethics states that you can advertise your services as free to buyers. All right, plaintiffs claim this further clouds the buyer's interest or knowledge in negotiating commissions. And the whole theme is the buyer cannot negotiate their own commissions with their own representative. They can, but in most cases they don't. Uh, total by broker commissions, and this is one that was kind of evidentiary, that, that the broker commissions have not declined as the rise in information increases. And this is based on the economic principle that the more educated the consumer is, the lower the consumer prices should pay. Uh, that true or not? I don't know, but that's what the lawsuits are saying. So here's the takeaway. And this is the part you ought to be going, hmm, okay. Uh, this is going to take five to seven years for these class action lawsuits to settle out. But they will likely catalyze, not automatically cause effect, but likely catalyze these changes, widespread and enhanced transparency of buyer brokers offers commission, okay? More buyer brokers being compensated directly by the buyer. More buyers negotiating the amount of commission their buyer brokers receive. And then finally, changes to the NARA policy and perhaps even the code of ethics. One, chain, the one, one of the main reasons that Realtracks was not included in this lawsuit is because you can't go on there and search by buyer agent compensation. That's not a field you can include in any search feature. And that's where they dodged the bullet. But in many other MLSs across, across the country, you can. And that's a problem. Because if you show properties that have higher compensation that are not what your client wants to see, just because they have higher compensation, then you could be having a problem later on. So there's two points I want to reiterate here also is that you need to keep this in mind that there's no other country in the world where real estate agents make the same percentage that you do in America. Most of them make one and a half percent in other countries of the world. Okay. In almost every other country, the buyer broker is also paid directly by the buyer, not by the listing agent. Huge differences. 
And those are also precedences that are being used in these lawsuits to change, modify the way that we do business here in the U.S. Trend number nine, this is one that we've talked about all year. If you are surprised by this, then you've been sleeping all year. Data security. Data security means wire fraud. Remember those conversations? Okay. Um, wire fraud, hackers, ransomware, they're all becoming rampant. Another reason we changed our network vendor, because we wanted to install more security to protect what data we have. Uh, the takeaway on this is you need to keep your personal computer up to date. If you are operating off a Windows machine right now, it is riff with vulnerabilities. You need to get rid of it immediately. Because we just did. About $15,000 worth of bullpen computers are going out the door next week to the garbage because we had to replace them and make sure our, data, our networks are secure. You have the same issue. You have a lot of information stored on your personal computer that a hacker would love to have. Ensure your websites that you're dealing with are secure. Make sure that URL has HTTPS. If it does not have that S, it is not a secure website and somebody on a Wi-Fi network next to you can see exactly what you're doing. Only deal with vendors such as title companies who use proper practices and encrypted technology. Uh, all title companies should be doing this by now, but I understand there's a few that are not. So get away from them, quickly. Uh, and then never, ever, 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 ever receive or transmit wire instructions to a client. Don't you touch it. Don't you touch it. Uh, Millennium, excuse me, Momentum. <laughs> I do that all the time. Momentum has, uh, has secure encrypted ways to do that, to transmit the wiring instructions. So if you deal with a company like that, you do not have to worry about it. Trend eight, re-identifying or redefining the edge of the real estate transaction. And that's kind of a confusing title, but what does that mean? We're talking about concierge services for consumers post-transaction. Okay. Typically, the real estate agent and broker view is one shot and done. I'm going to deliver services for this transaction and then I'm done. And what we're talking about is the extension of that. So consider all the money that's spent on additional stuff post-closing. Uh, home improvements, utility scheduling, movers, insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The National Association of Home Builders estimates that's as much as $10,000 per client within the first six months. And if we could get a piece of that, if we could get into that cash flow stream, then it would be additional revenue for you and for uh, easier, better service for the consumer. Well, there are now companies that are doing that. So it's facilitated by automated tra transaction automation through dot loop, transaction desk, DocuSign, those sorts of things. But specifically, the companies that were mentioned were Updater, uh, whom I have had many conversations with, by the way, MoveEasy and MoveGuru. They accept the data from the brokerage of the client contact information, and then they contact the client to assist with moving, junk disposal, shipping vehicles, home setup, all the things that somebody who's moving house has to deal with in the first few months. Um, the important thing for you to remember though is that all of these products and all these services and points of contacts are branded back to you. Okay, so you remember how we used to have the magazine that you could sign up when you had a closing? They could send a, get a magazine for every month for a year for like $14. This is kind of the same thing except it's not a, the magazine, it's a literal usable product to help them get set up in their business and to help them manage their cable network and help them manage their ongoing services. Again, they're all branded back to you. And the important thing is there's a built-in feedback loop so that when the consumer begins to express behavior that usually indicate they're about to move or make a move decision, they alert you, the agent. Hey, this guy's over here looking on online at houses. You need to contact him, you need to reach out to him. So data harvesting and appropriate use allows the brokerage and agent to finally overcome the challenges by providing real value beyond the transaction. And then providing additional services for the lifetime of the consumer is a best practice in combating erosion of your value proposition to the consumer. Something that we battle every day. Also a great defense on your commission too. Trend number seven, the MLS is in jeopardy. Uh, and, the, and the big question here is can the industry pull it together? Uh, there are 598 MLSs in the country, many of whom remain mired in archaic business structures and local power struggles. 
I would say most of them remain mired in local power struggles. Uh, your associations, actually many of the local as realtor associations would not exist if it were not for a dividend from real tracks. Okay, because they don't have another reason other than the fact they have ownership and they can charge that. Uh, so many MLSs serve as the primary revenue stream for the realtor associations with them and in rendering many all but paralyzed because many associations often prefer dividends over reinvestment. And that's a problem for some associations. I will commend Realtracks highly because they have done an excellent job at fending this off, even though they have a board of directors that's made up from a representative from each member association, so they're still a little beholding to them. But for the most part, they've done a really good job at fending that off. But some of the smaller ones, they don't. They just succumb to it. Declining and incomplete, these are some of the challenges. Declining and incomplete for sale inventory in their databases. Uh, proliferating large broker strategy of marketing homes on their own company website for extended periods of time before they enter them in the MLS. NAR just passed a rule on that, didn't it? They call it clear cooperation. Go look it up. I think it's a good first effort, but I think it falls far short of being enforceable on the grand scheme of things over the long term. And then you got to understand this part, we'll, we'll, this will be a recurring theme, the external capital that is flooding into our market, continuing to flood into our market, it's radically stepped up investment in alternative business models that threatened previously exclusive, exclusive to MLS domain of data controller. So if the data, if people start realizing they can't just, that they can get the data elsewhere for free, as opposed to going through you, then that is an erosion of your value proposition, so it's something to be aware of with the MLSs. Uh, expanding iBuyer markets, and that's a word that we're going to hear a lot today, uh, which national iBuyer companies occasionally buy, list, and sell homes that are purchased without ever using the MLS. That happens a lot more than you realize. We went back and did some tracking on the data on iBuyers. Once they purchase a home, where do they go? Do they come back on the market? A full 42% of them don't come back on the market. Once an iBuyer buys a home, who do they sell it to? Institutional investors. All right, so that is a constant erosion of your inventory levels and it is also a threat to the MLS. The growth and consolidation of brokerages and data vendors into national entities which provide brokerage firms with the ability to serve as a listing database is at a scale that this industry has never seen before. Important points. Takeaways, there's lots of things the MLS can do. I'm not going to read through all of them because they are ad nauseum. But more than anything, adhering to standardized data sources, RISO standards, consolidate, co collaborate across geographic areas. We've just now tapped into another MLS. We're very blessed right here in where we operate mostly to have a regional MLS. And in most places, that is not the case. There are multiple MLSs in a city this size. In Atlanta, there are two major MLSs. You have to belong to both of them or you don't get to play. That's how it works. Trend number six, the diminishing financial viability of the traditional brokerage model. By traditional brokerage, it'll define that as a, as a uh, fee-based, uh, excuse me, as a percentage-based split model as a traditional brokerage. So one thing is very clear is the traditional commission percentage split-based model, a residential real estate brokerage is being squeezed on all sides. The rise of the capped fee split brokerage models, can you say benchmark, hello? Uh, has shifted the broker's role to more of a service provider to the agents and away from complete dependency of the agents upon the brokerage for business. In many traditional models that still exists, even though it's becoming less and less in our particular area. And here's some interesting facts. In the past five years, the average the, what is left to pay the bills with after all commissions are paid of the traditional broker has declined from around 35 percent down to 16 percent and i picked up an email this morning from real trends that said that had now dropped to 13.8 percent so they are dependent on a revenue stream that is compressing and they have to continue to deliver services that the agents are demanding more of so it puts pressure on them hence you see mergers and acquisitions of trying to gather forces so that you can combat it as agents continue to move toward greater dependence independence in their business uh, these margins will continue to decline and the point that the book makes is that brokerages must rigorously analyze overhead costs and control expenses to improve every line on the PL, which is exactly why we went through the reorganization earlier this year. 
So the takeaway, traditional brokerage models face daunting times as revenues continue to decline and expenses continue to increase. The bottom line, the ground is shifting underneath the feet of this industry segment and without movement, brokerages who've operated the rules and guidelines of previous era will not likely not remain standing. Their words, not mine. It's coming, it's coming. Now let's talk about, just take one step back and talk about how does Benchmark do compared to that. This is a special insert because I've got a little flash up there. It's a special insert. I don't have any applause though, so it's okay. Yeah, there you go, okay, special insert. <clears throat> let's talk about our money. Let's talk about Benchmark's money. In 2019, as you saw, we paid $70 million in commissions, okay? If you guys were on an 80-20 split, our part of that would have been $14 million that we would have to do some really nice parties like this with, right? On a regular basis, right? If we were on 85-15, we would have had $10 million of that, right? Because that's what the math shows, and we could have had even more really good parties there, okay? But our number was four and a half million. That's four and a half million to run everything. And I wanted to emphasize that to you so you can understand the strength of the model versus what your competing agent can do. You can offer more services, you can be more active, you can invest more money in marketing. That's why we're giving you the money. Don't go buy a fancy new car with it, reinvest it in your business. And you will kick the butts of the competitors. And most importantly, we're still profitable. So there you go. I just had to throw that in there so you can understand what the real numbers are. And by the way, of four and a half million, that's for rents, for salaries, for the tools, everything we do. Of the four and a half million, almost 800,000 of it is rents. Okay, so when you gripe at me about how much I'm charging for your office rent, you're not paying for all of your office rent. I'm paying for part of it. We are paying for part of it. Trend number five, Compass. This is a name that we've heard around and about quite a bit actually, building a modern traditional brokerage from the ground up. Again, these are national trends, okay? Uh, they call a modern brokerage, traditional brokerage, and I have modern in quotes. You can do air quotes if you want to. Uh, but a, I call it modern because they've got money. Uh, basically, one third of the 14,000 agents nationwide, nearly 5,000 of them, were obtain, obtained through acquisitions. In other words, they bought the agents. They bought the companies the agents work for. Uh, vastly different from other traditional brokerages because they have billions of dollars in investor capital to spend on building in-house tech, marketing platforms, and on brand building. And since the 2012 launch, they have received $1.5 billion in venture capital. That's through the third quarter of 2019. That's a lot of cash to throw around. So what are the key components? Well, they offer sign-on bonuses to the, again, air quotes, right agents, okay? From five to six figures. And in a few cases, the bonus was seven figures. And for those of you who don't do math well, that would be 100,000 to 900,000 would be six figures. And seven figures would be a million plus. Yes, there were agents in California that actually got a check for a million dollars to join Compass. Or to not leave Compass, I might say. Okay, once the company that they lived with was acquired. They're also offering lines of credit for agents who consider themselves developers. Uh, in some cases, as much as $1.5 million line of credit. At zero interest, but guess what? As long as there's one penny out on that line of credit, you ain't leaving. It's got hooks in it. Initially low spits, splits, spits if you want to, uh, <laughs> 95.5, 97.3, which that increased after 12 months toward a company-wide average of a 70.30. That's what their business model is based on is 70.30. So anything off of that is strictly temporary. And then agents can participate in recommending improvements to their tech stack. You guys all have my email. Do you want to make a recommendation? Make a recommendation. That's not novel, but they're, supposedly they're part of the modern brokerage that is. Uh, purported to be working on an AI-based platform to power all real estate decisions for the lifetime of the real estate consumer. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but that's what it says in the book, so I put it up here on the screen. But I do know they have lots of heavy marketing and branding for the creative department employs over 100 designers. And this is company-wide, not just here, obviously. And then they have Compass concierge, which I think is kind of cool. They'll actually loan money to a seller to do fix-ups on their house and they get paid back at closing. 
That's kind of cool. Uh, in 2018, Compass brashly declared the goal of 2020, and as of February 2020, they are not even close. So what does 2020 mean? 20% 20 market share in the top 20 markets by the year 2020. What year is it? <laughs> they ain't there yet. Uh, except for San Francisco, where they acquired four of the top firms in San Francisco, and they actually do have a 30% market share in San Francisco, achieving this goal is mathematically very doubtful. Uh, getting to even 10% in each market due to the large size of the 20 markets is a formidable feat for almost any company. This company has never been profitable, and current trend lines do not indicate profitability in the foreseeable future, so it is living on investor money. Everything they're doing is on investor money. Trend number four, talking about Keller Williams. Now, I have said in my mind some bad things about Keller Williams in the past. <laughs> I don't genuinely say them out loud, but sometimes they do slip out. They have an excellent model. They, do, they really do have an excellent model. It's just, unless you want to drink some Kool-Aid, you might be lost in the crowd. But they, uh, this section of the book talks about the invest, Innovator's Dilemma. And The Innovator's Dilemma was a book that was published in 97 by a fellow named Christensen. It talks about companies can do everything right and still lose market share as unexpected competitors rise and redefine the market. They change the consumer's mind, the market changes. And so you can be glorious and profitable and have the best business in the world going, but something may come out of left field and, and blindside you. And here's, it's based around five principles. Principle number one was resource dependency. And basically that demand drives allocation of resources. If somebody, if a consumer really wants a product, then you're gonna spend resources on it. Uh, number two is that small markets don't solve the growth needs of large companies. That's very true, right? We could not open benchmark in Aston City, and the market's just simply not big enough. No slight on Ashland City, it's just not in a big enough market. And the ultimate use of disruptive technologies are unknowable in advance. How many jobs today do you know people are in that deal with technology that didn't even exist three years ago? Lots, lots, and it's picking up speed. Incumbent businesses build success from processes refining for their existing paradigm. So the lens through which a company ownership or company leadership views the, uh, the, the world, their marketplace, defines how they build their business. So you have to, in many cases, change that paradigm. You have to look at the world from a different lens because if you look at it through the same lens every day for the rest of your life, you may miss the boat. And then finally, because of innovative technologies often fit a new paradigm that addresses different challenges in new ways, established markets often do not value them properly. Established companies often do not see their utility. You can have the best mousetrap in the world, but if nobody understands the use of that mousetrap, it won't be, uh, won't be used. And they've come up with a Keller Cloud. And Keller Cloud is essentially, they claim that they're investing a billion dollars in it over several years. It's purported to be building an AI-driven platform to manage the consumer's needs. And an agent's business all in a single place called Command. And then they have Kelly, uh, which is their voice-activated personal assistant. I've got one of those, I married her over here. But she, uh, <laughs> she's awesome, by the way. Um, they're talking they have about a 25% adoption rate. Now, Kelly, they've had out for about three years now, and they only have a 25% adoption rate. By the way, our Real Scout, we've been out less than a year, and we're already at a 40% adoption rate. So kudos to you. It can give you an idea. <clears throat> and then consumer-focused KW app to search the MLS, which, again, you got that too, right? So the takeaway is the vision appears exciting, the platform and seamless integration is compelling, the artificial intelligence components potentially very valuable. However, and you knew there was a but here, right? The solution still operates in an industry that's disjointed, has localized practices, ownership, and forms, and integrations with older software presents some serious challenges. So the bottom line, though, is they're a private company, and no one knows what they're really doing or if they're having any success at all. Statistically, we're not seeing it in the marketplace so much of their investment, but we'll see. It is an important trend that you need to be aware of. Trend number three, the great Satan, Zillow, <laughs> right? Now, there's a bunch of you love Zillow, and I kind of like Zillow, depending on what day of the week it is and what they've done to me that week, but 
Whether you like them or not, they are accelerating transformation in our industry. And from this point to the rest of the presentation is where it gets really interesting. You need to pay real close attention to this, okay? This is a company of transformation. They've had three basic stages. Stage one, they were a portal, right? They came up with the AVM, the Zestimate and they offered the consumer a search engine. And then they shifted or pivoted, as people like to say, uh, became a digital media company, and that lasted all the way up to 2017. That's when they came up with the premier agent product, and they started selling you guys a bunch of leads off of their search engine platform. And then stage three is the part you ought to be going, uh, you ought to be paying attention to stage three and Zillow, because these guys are getting deadly serious. They are becoming with the introduction of instant offers to accelerate the premier agent sales, they, become, they came, became a brokerage to accept referral fee payments via Zillow Flex, and they added Zillow Home Loans and a bunch of other stuff. So their growth, Dot Loop, they acquired in 2015 for $100 million. And I'll make a comment about this, and I've heard this before, and it irritates the crap out of me every time I hear it. I'm not going to do business with Dot Loop because that's a Zillow company. Dot Loop operates under HIPAA compliant laws. If they share your data, they go to the federal penitentiary. They are not sharing your data, okay? Take that one off the table. Bridge Interactive, which is data management for cross MLS needs. We talked about earlier MLSs, multiple MLSs in the same geographic area. And now they've acquired mortgage, title and escrow, and now deploying heavy artificial intelligence with 200 million unique visitors every month to Zillow.com. They're sitting on top of massive amounts of data massive amounts of data that no single brokerage, no national brokerage, no local brokerage, no consortium of brokerages can match. And they're getting it not from your MLS, they're getting it from the consumer because the consumer is giving it to them. Zillow Offers is their newest project which is only about a year and a half old and this is the one you ought to watch. It's their iBuyer. They have completely pivoted the entire company and they have bet the farm on Zillow Offers. They envision growing in the next three to five years to purchasing 5,000 homes per month, or approximately 60,000 houses per year, representing 20 billion, with a B, 20 billion dollars in value. Consumers already consider the site the primary place to go online for an instant home valuation. That's just a given. You've all sat in listening presentations. Well, Zillow says dot 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 dot, right? So it's programmed into them. And when they do, a pop-up asks them, hey, would you like to have an offer on your house? And if they say no, then they want, would you like to be connected to a premier agent? So they're trying to control the entire transaction. During the second quarter of 2019, the most recent data Zillow offers prices were within 1% of market, plus a 7.5% service fee. We'll talk more about iBuyers in just a second. This is a profile of a Zillow offers transaction and because of time I'm not going to walk you through that, I intended to. It talks about people are going on Zillow and selling their houses to them. And they go to another place and they buy a house from a Zillow agent at the other place. And they use a Zillow home loan and they use a Zillow title company. So they're trying to completely vertically integrate the transaction. Time changes all disruptors though, irrespective of the industry over the 15 years, Zillow has now become a vertically integrated real estate company, make no mistake about it. Zillow arose though, this is the point I've advocated for years because we as brokers failed. The consumer was demanding flexible options and the broker industry said, mm -mm, we've got the Happy Meal, we got the hamburger, but the only way you the consumer can buy this hamburger is if you buy the entire Happy Meal. What Zillow said is, hey, we'll sell you just the hamburger if that's what you want. So it's our own fault that we're in the position we're in. Now the trick is to, what are we gonna do about it going forward? That's the challenge. Trend two, inside the VC's mind, venture capitalists are driving the force behind real estate's major transformations. Who are these investors? First of all, you have to understand the difference in venture capital and private equity. Okay, venture capital is typically a fund of money that invests in startups with its startups, not existing companies, but startups with the intent of growing the company and then cashing out by taking that company public. Typical timeline is three to five years if all goes well. Single product orientation generally. Private equity, on the other hand, will invest in companies with a longer timeline, 10 to 20 years. These are pools of money made up from limited partners usually acquiring a platform company and then bolting on additional companies to that platform in an existing, um, in an existing industry 
you know, the goal of improving overall operations and profitability. So there's two distinct different types of investors here that you need to understand. And, and the VC, the venture capital name, is thrown around a lot but they're completely different type of investment processes. How, how much money is out there? I read a Bloomberg article in January the 2nd of this year that said private equity firms hit, led by Blackstone and Carlisle finished 2019 with $1.5 trillion in uninvested capital. That's money looking for a home. $1.5 trillion. What's the entire economy of the U.S.? It's about $6 trillion. Okay, think about that for a minute. That's a lot of money. This is the highest year-end total on record in the history of tracking private equity. And given that 2019 saw four and a half billion dollars in private equity deals, the article states that mergers and acquisitions in 2020 will be on a scale not seen since the financial crisis. So there's going to be a lot more names changed and a lot more companies joining forces, a lot more things happening. Venture capital firms that operate within our industry, these are just a few of them. Uh, Fifth Wall, NFX, Modern Ventures. Uh, Fifth Wall, they are the primary investor behind Open Door, Notarized, and Hippo. Uh, NFX is uh, one of the founders of Tril Trulia. Modern Ventures, uh, they own Contactually, HomeSnap, uh, TaskEasy. And they're owned, their major contributor, a major investor in Modern Ventures Fund is Leading RE. And who's the big owner of Leading RE? Brother Harold. Right? That's why he's always pushing home snap. Use home snap. Use home snap. There you go. The math never lies. Second City, uh, Second City Ventures is actually owned by NAR. Okay? And they invest in new startups. They just did a big deal when they cashed out of DocuSign when DocuSign went public. They had a $200 million windfall. But your dues didn't go down, did they? Uh, and then uh, SoftBank is a big one here. They, they really made their name and their money with T-Mobile and Sprint and Alibaba. They also are the money behind Compass, Uber, and WeWork. Okay, big money, big money chasing our industry. Investment capital's larger, larger role in the industry is not a temporary gamble. This is the new normal because it's here has got to confront these new market dynamics that are created by this excess cash that's flowing in their industry. And they have no immediate requirement for profitability either, okay, because it's investor money. They can wait 10 years. They can wait 20 years because they're betting on the big turn. The only way for incumbents to successfully confront this is to refocus efforts on their stability and their strengths in order to establish a new equilibrium alongside the newcomers. Trend number one, and I'm moving on real fast here because we're almost out of time. Uh, trend number one, the iBuyer revolution, which is redefining the real estate transaction. The transaction versus a traditional sale. You can see here on the screen. This first column is direct buyer. The second column is traditional sale. That's what you guys do, in case you didn't know. Uh, days to close on a direct buyer is five to 90 days. The buyer sets the, sets the date. Traditional sale, who knows, two or three months, right? Days to uh, prep and stage a home, zero days from direct buyer because you don't stage anything. One to two weeks on traditional sale. Showings, you'll have zero showings on direct buyer. You'll have uh, one to 10 or 20 or 30 showings on a traditional sale. And the fee on the direct buyer is six to 13%. These are national average statistically defined, six to 13% and traditional sale is five to 6% until you factor in the carrying cost for two to three months. And you factor in the carrying cost for two to three months and the cost of those repairs and fix-ups, then you've got something that looks a little bit more level. Uh, again, traditional sale versus buyer sale, and this is straight out of the book on a $300,000 purchase. Uh, seller fees are 5.5% on traditional. They were 7.3%. This is about, this is across 20,000 data points over two years. This is factual data. This is not innuendo. This is not rumor. This is not talking to your buddy over coffee. Staging and home prep costs averaged $750 on iBuyer buyer sale, they're nothing. Seller concessions, including repair costs, negotiated after the contract, $850 on traditional, average $850 on iBuyer buyer also. Home ownership and overlap costs. It's rare to carry two mortgages in a traditional world, and an iBuyer buyer sale allows sellers to time the sales and avoid carrying two mortgages because they set their closing date and they set their buy date. Closing costs average 1% on traditional, average 1% on iBuyer buyer sale too. 
And the net difference there is 278,900 versus 274,250 for an iBuyer. That is a difference of $4,650 for 100% certainty. That should pucker you up pretty good right there. So you uh, will get into this a little bit deeper here, but for some consumer segments, you need to understand that that consumer is already gone. They have moved to the iBuyer. They will never return. Send them a Valentine's Day card and wish them luck. What's the descriptor of that? You take a uh, brother and sister. One lives in Idaho. One lives in Nebraska. Mama lived in Nashville. Mama died. They need to get rid of the house. They don't care about trying to get market value. They just want to liquidate it. They're going to go on to iBuyer and in about 30 seconds sell that house and be done. That consumer is gone forever unless you have really tight claws in them. Uh, recipient of more investment money than any other sector of the real estate brokerage industry and that is rapidly expanding even as we stand here and talk about it. Clearly none are profitable yet, but as the algorithms refine and as the network effects come into play, that will change. It's a network effect. The more you do something, the more often you do something, the better you get at it, the more efficient you become at it. Some would call it economies of scale in some cases. It's a network effect and the algorithms are getting better every day. So the model clearly addresses consumer pain points in the transaction process and investors are pouring millions into well-run companies that have smart leadership. It is a factual element of our industry that we need to embrace and not run from and shy away from, but you also need to understand what it is. And to help you understand, that's the end of the top 10 trends and I'm gonna break off and now go to um, Mike Del Preti. I mentioned him earlier. He's a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and he does more research. He actually teaches classes on iBuyers. He does more research, statistical research. I want you to hear from him just a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about a presentation that he did at Inman Connect about two weeks ago. Uh, that's him on stage, by the way. And I don't know why professors don't wear jackets, but they don't apparently. So here's a little video to kind of set up the scenario. So I teach a class in real estate tech at the University of Colorado Boulder, one of the first of its kind around the world. Last semester I was talking to my students about iBuyers, and when you look at what they buy a house for and then what they sell it for after expenses, it's basically the same. It's basically even, right? Break even. And I was trying to illustrate this point, I was up in front of them, and I said, all right, students, what would you say if I told you I was buying chairs for $100 and selling those chairs for $100. What would you say about that business? It was quiet in the classroom. Uh, eventually somebody in the back kind of raised their hand, yes? He said, it's not about the chair. It's not about the chair. I thought that was a really astute observation. So for iBuyers, it's not about the house. It's about the transaction. It's not about the chair. It's about the other services and products that can layer on to that consumer and make money with. Title is profitable. Uh, mortgage is profitable. That's the reason we have them. You've got a consumer and you can continue to sell the product. That's why the other trends that I mentioned earlier are so important that we're gonna be rolling out this year. So one thing that he mentioned in his presentation was the industry is moving very slowly but has never moved this fast. Congratulations. You happen to be here at this point in time in history. I buyer transaction values from 2017, 2018, 2019. Went from about 10,000 transactions in 2017 to 2019. It finished up right at 60,000 transactions. You equate that in percentage terms from 2018 to 2019 alone, their market share doubled. It's 0.25% and 0.5%. You can say, well, those are little bitty numbers. This is a national number, okay? Not a Nashville number, a national number. If you can double your market share in anything on a national basis, you're cooking with Wesson. That equates to 8.7 billion plus in total sales that went to iBuyers in 2019. Who are they? Well, these are the big top dogs here. You have Open Door, Zillow, OfferPad, and Redfin in that order. But look at, the, you know, mentioned Zillow just a minute ago. Look at the difference here. Where did their market share come from? They increased their market share from 3% to 18% in the overall buyer market. And if you want to look at that in express in growth percentage terms, Open Door increased their market share 95%, their transaction count. 
Zillow increased their market transaction count 1,200%. They're deadly serious about what they're doing. Offer pads still increased, Redfin still increased. The top iBuyer markets, thank God Nashville's not on here. <laughs> Phoenix, which is kind of the, where the whole thing started, right? Maybe somebody ought to drop a bomb on that. Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, so on and so forth. We're not even in the top 10, which is, which is outstanding. And these are the ones that, with arrows on them that, where the greatest growth occurred in those areas. iBuyer purchase prices. And this is the great misnomer that a lot of people don't understand about iBuyers. Within their buy box, and you hear that term a lot when you're dealing with this segment of the industry, is what is the profile of the type of house where they do best? They are brutal. They are eviscerating the market. They may say they buy houses from $100,000 to a $1 million, but they don't. Okay? They buy houses in this sweet spot right here, which is their buy box. So well, those markets that I just showed you, what's different about them and us? You have mile after mile after mile after mile of subdivision that is the same house with a different facade. And the algorithm can nail that value in and dial it in and they can become extremely effective at it. And here's the proof. They're within 98.6% of the median home price. And again, this is over 20,000 data points over two years. This is not rumor. This is not innuendo. This is factual data I'm presenting to you that they are actually within 1.4% or $3,800 on a $275,000 house of actual market value that you would be able to get for that consumer. And 100% certainty. What's driving their growth? Well, it comes from Essentially, uh, you can see here in 2018, this is uh, 15, you know, 12,000 markets there, or 12,000 houses, 2019, way on up there. Where did all that come from? Just so you know, the purple part is Open Door and the pink part is Zillow. And it comes from new markets, opening consistent new markets. Zillow is opening a new market, sometimes three markets a month. And I'm not talking about they hang up a sign and open an office. I'm talking about actually buying houses and selling houses in that market. That's January through December of 2019. Zillow on the top line, open door on the bottom line. Zillow is far outpacing the others. However, they're losing their butt, right? They lost 45 million in quarter one of 2019. They lost 71 million in quarter two of 2019. They lost $87 million in one quarter, the third quarter of 2019. That's close to $300 million that they lost on this project in 2019. And that does not include fourth quarter, because I don't have fourth quarter data. So the scoffers say they're not profitable yet. How can they last? How can they do this? And I would say a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, Amazon finally turned a profit in 2003, which was nine years after they were founded and seven years after they went public. They're not in a hurry to turn a profit. They can wait it out. Some of my good friends who are consultants in this industry, and this is Rob Hahn, Notorious Rob, he says that by 2024, 60% of all real estate transactions will be with an iBuyer. I think he's bat crap crazy, but, and I've told him that because we have a bet on this. This wager he's talking about here is a Wagyu steak dinner that I bet him it will not exceed 25%. But think about what I just said. It's 25% of the market. So you need to expand your business 25% just to stay even. See how that math works? And remember, profitability, it's not just about the chair. It's about all the other products they can sell them because that's how companies survive. That's how companies grow. It's getting there. As my old boss used to say, son, you get, a, you get a client, you sink your iron talons into them and you don't let go until they buy or they die. And that's what you got to have to do, plain and simple. So reiterate, the industry is moving very slow, but it's never moved this fast. And if you want to look up some of Mike Del Preti's work, that's his website, MikeDP.com. It's a real highly technical name for his website. That's it. I just want to give you some parting thoughts, though, that will help you feel energized and positive because I've actually stomped all over you today. But you came here for honesty, right? If you'd come here for fluff, you wouldn't be here. If you'd come here for fluff, you wouldn't be with Benchmark. You guys are all business people, so let's talk about business here. We have some challenges ahead, point blank, no question about it. 
the fact the consumer has been permanently Amazonized with the increasing expectation of press button yet magic and your service much match their need. Zillow.com receives nearly 200 million unique visits per month. Unique, not Sister Julie that went there 14 times in the same day. This is 200 million Sister Julies that went there one time. Yet there were only 5.54 real estate transactions in all of last year. So there is runway here. There is bandwidth. There is a way to grow the business. From contract to closing, the national average of time length is 42 days with lots of pain in between. And the fact is that the brokerage industry is so fragmented and has consistently failed to solve these consumer pain points, we must find a way to reduce the friction in the transaction. You have to find a way to reduce the friction in your client's transaction. Picking the low-hanging fruit, rolling out of the rack at 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning is over if you're going to stay in this business. And I know all of you got up early and came down here. It's a special case and I really appreciate it. You guys are going to win. So here's the good news though. No matter how much technology and capital flows in our industry, the real estate agent continues to be an important and relevant part of every transaction. But failing to be proactive will result in becoming irrelevant. And to remain relevant, you got to get your butt up out of bed and go to work every damn day. <laughs> right? And a good agent will always be a critical part of the transaction, but your role will continue to change and you have to embrace that. You can't resist that. You have to understand it. You have to get ahead of it. And above all, whenever there's this huge amount of change and disruption, it creates magnificent opportunity. Because if the old world stays the same, they would never. Our model came from these disruptions in the beginning stages. So I'm going to show you a quickie video here that I know you're all going to appreciate. And it's the old Navy guy in me that comes out. <laughs> Have you seen this? Yeah. Watch this for a minute. Thirty plus years of service. Combat medals, citations. Only man to shoot down three enemy planes in the last forty years. Yet you can't get a promotion. You won't retire. Despite your best efforts, you refuse to die. should be at least a two-star admiral by now. Yet here you are, Captain. Why is that? It's one of life's mysteries, sir. inevitable maverick you kind of set it for extinction maybe so sir but not today maybe so sir but not today by golly opportunity ahead just watch out for the pot Call for coming.